Welcome to First in Fiction, your first stop for learning to write great fiction. I'm your host, Aaron Gansky, author of the Hand of Adonai series, First in Fiction, and The Bargain. I almost forgot one. That's terrible. <laughs> I'm Alton Gansky from the middle part of uh, California, and my latest two books are 30 Events That Shaped the Church and 60 People That Shaped the Church. You say, those are nonfiction books. What are you doing on a program like this? Well, I've done close to 30 novels as well, and I'm also working... Um, with three other writers to do a, a series of small books, novellas, that look like this. Oh, you got one. Yeah, I went ahead and ordered one. Show, show them again. Sorry, I'll, I'll stop oh. talking so it'll focus on you. All right, so I'll start talking so the camera will switch over here. This is uh, Bill Myers' The Call. It's the first, uh, the f first set of four uh, novels. You can see it's very thin. It's meant to be read in just you know one or two settings. Uh, different character in each of the books, Supernatural Suspense, and uh, Frank Paredes is the next up. It comes out in a, a, just a week or so, something like that. And so let's look forward, and then Angie Hunts comes out, uh, I think, a month after that or so. And then uh, I bring up the caboose. I'm the caboose of the project. I kind of like the episodic idea and, and, and almost almost bringing back that whole serial novel kind of feel to it and, uh, the old films where you'd have the cliffhangers and and have to go back the following week. So, um, I like I, I like that aspect, and I also like the fact that um, you can get them quick. You're not waiting a year for the next iteration. So, um, you know, it's it's consumable and it's available. I like that. So, some cool stuff there. I haven't had a chance to get to uh, the call yet. It's on my to-do list, uh, and uh, I will get to it hopefully soon. And and give it that shining endorsement, etc. Well, I and appreciate that. It's been uh, it's been fun. It's um, I know we're committed to the next four after that because uh, Bill Myers is hard at work on his, which takes place in Italy, I think. So that'll be interesting to see. Well, speaking <laughs> of shining endorsements, how's that for a transition? You like that, pops? I do. I do. It's almost like I planned it, like I'd been thinking about it all day. So um, you'll notice the website address at the bottom of my uh, little tag here is is different. Uh, it's not my normal AaronGansky.com. Instead, it's uh, for our audio podcast listeners. It's Indiegogo.com slash projects slash the green bench film. And there's hyphens between all of those words. So it's the hyphen green hyphen bench hyphen film. You say, why is that? on your uh, lower third there, Aaron, and I'm glad you asked. Uh, the Green Bench is uh, was originally, as I understand, a piece of flash fiction that C the Citron Review had an opportunity to publish early on, about five years ago when we first started uh, publishing things, uh, five, almost six years ago, uh, written by Diane Sherlock, who is the my co-writer. We wrote uh, uh, Right to be Heard. We wrote that together, and a uh, great little piece of flash fiction that she's since developed into a larger work, uh, including a screenplay. Uh, and they are now in the process. She's got a director for it, as I understand. I think she's maybe has some actor or actors on board, and, and this is a film they want to produce. Uh, but as, as everything in Hollywood does, it, it's going to cost some money. So they are raising some funds at Indiegogo.com slash projects slash the Green Bench Film. Uh, it's about mental health and uh, some of the, the uh, social stigmas attached to it in a, a family that has to uh, go through the process of discovery of what mental illness means and, and how to deal with it. Um, very touching, very moving. Uh, if you go to the Indiegogo site, there's a great little four-and-a-half-minute video, plus or minus, where the director gets to talk about it, and you hear some other experts talk about the subject matter. So some really cool stuff. She's a very quality writer. She's a very quality human being. Honored to, uh, to be able to have worked with her. Uh, and if you get a, a chance with your... I know we're all rich, so if you want to swing on by and donate three or four thousand dollars, or two or three dollars, uh, you know every little bit helps and adds up. So they would definitely appreciate that. And I just thought, uh, thought I'd give that a shout out real quick. So the Green Bench film on Indiegogo, and uh, if you can look into that, that we would be uh, greatly honored for you to do that. So, well, that sounds uh, that sounds great. I've used Indiegogo uh, once before. 
and uh, good company. Yeah, uh, the Green Bench film. You could go to Indiegogo and just search for that, the Green Bench film, and it'd probably take you to the site. That'd be my guess. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, they're pretty good about that, and searching is uh, is pretty good. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say hi to uh, those that are v are viewing us uh, live. Uh, mm -hmm. You're probably too young to know this, as they are also. I'm sure too young to know. Uh, Romper Room. Do you remember Romper Room? I, I know of it by reputation, yeah. Well, every time I look at who's uh, watching live uh, on the program, I feel like the teacher in Romper Room was basically a kindergarten show. So it was a child education show, and I was young. I'd watch them. She would pull up this magic mirror that she would look into. It always puzzled me because there was no mirror in it. She could see through it. But apparently that's what made it magic, and she would always say, I can see Angie Arndt, I can see Bruce Bra uh, Brady, and she would go through this long list of people, uh, and she'd just make these names up, you know, because there's always going to be someone out there. But she never called my name. I see David Fessenden, you know, and that's rude. So, never yeah. called your name. Yeah, I, I, we were just down in San Diego looking at some of those little souvenirs, like the little license plates with the names on them or whatever it is, and they always have uh, two of our three names of our children. They always have the Elijah and the Levi, but I've yet to see a Josiah at any of those. So I imagine if uh, Josiah were watching Romper Room, he might be disappointed as well. So is that a, a pretty deep wound for you, Pops? Do you need some spiritual healing for that or some sort of... Uh, what, realizing I'm old and no it? longer... A there's a lot of years I don't want to relive. <laughs> right. I could I could tell you that. Well, we need to go ahead and move right into this um, because people didn't tune in to uh, listen to me reminisce about Romper Room, but uh, just want to say hi to everybody who's here. Absolutely. Uh, publishing term for the week, you have one of those lined up? You know, we skipped it last week. Did we really? Yeah, I think, I think we did, and... Um, and now, uh, now that you have me, but I'll give you a little bit of a publishing a trivia. We all know what uppercase means in letters and what lowercase means in letters. Mm -hmm. What a lot of people don't realize is why they're called uppercase and lowercase. And it goes back to Gutenberg after the invention of the movable type uh, printing press. And you kept, uh, he made individual letters. And that meant so you'd have to have capital letters and you'd have to have lowercase letters, what we call those now. Um, and uh, you kept all the capitals in the upper case where you would set the type. There were two cases. The upper case oh. was where all the capitals were. The lower case is where all the lower case ones, and that's why we call them upper case and lower case. Uh, so there's a real life uh, situation that uh, brought that, that terminology around. That is really cool. I, I didn't really. It was a case that you uh, that you put them in. Um, I was going to say something about the printing press that that made a pretty significant change in our language as well. I know this is not the point of the podcast, so I'll make it this story fast. But our word orange, O R A N G E, is almost identical to the Spanish word for orange, which is naranja, N A R A N J E. The vowels and the consonants are almost identical, at least phonetically speaking. The only difference being that N at the beginning of the word. Well, it turns out that until the printing press an orange was a norange. But along comes the printing press and somebody said, hey, is this a space norange or is this an space orange? And they all kind of looked at each other and shrugged their shoulders and somebody said, it's an orange. Run with it. And that's that's how that's why we don't have an in on our norange anymore. So I Well we could spend the whole time talking about this. I'll just say this. It's called a printing press because it was modeled after a grape press that you would uh, squash grapes in so you can make wine. And that's why it's called a printing press, because it was literally a press. You press the paper down on the type. All right, moving on. We're going to be talking about what today? Uh, we are talking about Alan, Alex. Oh, goodness. You got Gutenberg in my head, and now I'm all discombobulated. Uh, well, it's not unusual in a man your age. No, it's Albert Zuckerman. Albert. Albert Zuckerman. That's what I was looking for there. Yeah. Albert, uh, Albert Zuckerman. Zuckerman. Yeah, he's a agent, writer's house, uh, still um, doing some of the agent work, but he had uh, uh, he had done some writing and he represented um, uh, some of the the top writers, represents some of the top writers, and uh, he did a study on what makes a best-selling book, and so he wrote a book, which I believe you can still get at Amazon. It's called Writing the Blockbuster Novel, 
writing the blockbuster novel, Albert Zuckerman, and I uh, found one of the chapters years ago be extremely helpful in, uh, in my working on novels, getting my ideas down in a way that uh, would carry over into the composition and into the to the reader. And so uh, you and I were talking about it. This be we decided to be a good thing to do an overview of, and then if necessary, we could go into individual uh, steps here, uh, qualities that a what he calls a big book has, um, and right. look at those in more detail if necessary. Yeah, we we've done uh, kind of writing rules before, uh, which is is very uh, very much kind of. Uh, limited to prose and how you structure your words and your sentences and and things of that nature but this is a like you say it's it's more of an overview of the elements of a quality of a blockbuster novel of, of one that's going to sell and that's kind of the the idea that he's got here so uh, there are six six things that he lists uh, and the first one is high stakes nice high and stakes Yes, and high stakes, again, um, so quick definition. Basically, you want to have something on the line. Your characters have to stand to lose something, and it's got to be something valuable. Uh, if we're walking along and a dime drops out of our pockets, we're not really concerned. Uh, but if we drop you know, a 20, then we're chasing after that thing, right? Because the stakes are a little bit higher. Now, of course, um, in a novel, you're going to want something a little bit larger than that, some some greater stakes, be it the fate of the world or the, the fate of your son, etc. So that's kind of what we're talking about with high stakes. What is, does Zuckerman go into some more detail here? What does he have to say about it? Well, he does. And one of the things he does first in the chapter is he distinguishes between the big book and the, the little book. And a big book, by his definition, is a book that's going to get attention. And what he's noticed, and this was, of course, years ago when he noticed this, but it still pertains today, what he noticed was that the best-selling books had certain things in common, and that were these six items, the, the first being high stakes. And I thought one of the things we might do is talk a little bit about Morris West's Shoes of the Fisherman, this first day of uh, Lent for those who are Roman Catholic, and so the AMC, uh, no, the Turner uh, old movie, the uh, TMC, I think it is, Turner Movie Classics, was playing the 1968 version of uh, that book, the movie for it with uh, Anthony Quinn. It's just an exceptional movie, but it has all those key points in it. Uh, so I thought we could use that uh, as a running uh, example of what we're talking about. You're right. Every big book, uh, there's something to be, uh, to be lost. There's something at stake. If the hero doesn't succeed, something is lost along the way. So what is it at stake? Well, that's going to vary from genre to genre. It's going to be very different, for example, in uh, uh, a romance than it is in uh, a Western, in a science fiction, uh, but especially in things like thrillers, mm -hmm. uh, suspense novels, those sorts of things. So the way I do it is I ask this question, what happens if my hero fails? Just fails to do whatever it is he or she needs to do, uh, who pays the price? And what is that price? I like that. I like the price. And I've always thought of it in, in that regard, kind of there's got to be a cost to something. If, if It must cost the character something if they don't succeed. Uh, usually, this is derived from what the character stands to lose. You, you can figure that out from what the character desires. What is the character's motivation here? Uh, it's either to keep something or gain something. Like you say in a romance, it's uh, for the boy to get the girl or vice versa. Uh, in an epic fantasy, it's for them to save the world or the Shire or whatever the case may be. So it's going to vary differently um, from from genre to genre, but the one thing that's going to be in common is this is going to be really the heart of the character's desire. Yeah, and there's many, many books that, uh, of course, touch on this, but let's go back to the Shoes of the Fisherman. Those who are not uh, familiar with it, it's about a, a lowly priest in the Ukraine. Uh, and this was done in 1968, so it's during the height of the Cold War, but it's supposed to have taken place in the future, uh, who was held in a gulag for 17 years, and there he suffered greatly. Uh, he's finally freed. He ends up back in Rome. Through a series of events, he becomes pope, though he doesn't want to become pope mm. with that. So now he's got this great position that he doesn't really want, 
and he's facing an international crisis, a uh, nuclear war that may either start from China, uh, from the then Soviet Union, and, uh, and the United States, and he is pressed into uh, trying to stop that uh, by being someone who only has words to use to keep that from happening. And interestingly enough, all the people do turn to this pope to mediate this if it's possible. They all agree to do that. So what's at stake? Well, uh, what he has to give up, of course, is his desire for a simple life. He slips out of the Vatican for time to time because he doesn't like to be cooped up in the Vatican. Uh, but if he fails, there could be nuclear war. Thousands will die. Maybe millions will die. So that's what's the high stakes. Uh, if he fails to do what he sets out to do, if he can't do it right, then the whole world pays a price. So that's a really, really set of high stakes. Uh, it doesn't have to be that high, of course. It could be someone who's falsely accused, and if uh, she fails, she goes to jail. Um, so it can be anything like that of, of any degree. Absolutely, yeah, the high stakes. <clears throat> I'd, I'd say, I mean, if you want that blockbuster book, that's what people are going to remember. I think of the movie Ransom. I'm not sure if you remember that, Pops. Um, mm. you, with Mel Gibson. Were the boys and, kidnapped? And, yeah, yeah, Mel Gibson, Rene Russo. If you haven't seen it, man, uh, it is a piece of work. Um, the 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 concept is, and we can kind of, we'll probably end up talking about high concept, but the concept is... Uh, a kid is is kidnapped and held for ransom, and Mel Gibson, the father, decides he's going to turn this around, and he says, instead of paying your ransom, this is now a bounty on my kidnap on the kidnapper's head, basically. So whoever brings me this kidnapper and brings me my kid, they're going to get this reward. And um, very very dramatic. Uh, you want to talk about high stakes? I mean, the, this kid's son is on the line. Uh, when he makes this decision, you know, it, it almost costs him his wife. His wife freaks out, says, you know, you, you've killed our son, you've killed our son. And there's, I mean, there's a, lot, there's a lot on the line here. It's not the fate of the world, but it is the fate of their family. It is the fate of his son. And, uh, you know, you could argue that there's nothing more important to him, even, even his money. Um, and so y you want to think about that. If What's on the line is going to also help to define your character. If somebody's kid is kidnapped and they're like, Meh, you can keep them. Like we learn a lot about the character there, and it's not going to be a very interesting story if they don't care about it. So the high stakes have to matter to the, your character, um, and usually to to a larger, broader um, s swath of the population. You know, if you're trying to save the world, um, but it definitely has to matter to your character. Those high stakes. So in in uh, Star Wars, what are the high stakes in Star Wars? Uh, that would be the fate of the galaxy, uh, right? I mean, you've got the evil emperor um, who is running things, and he's corrupt, and the you know he's taking away freedoms. Uh, it's the tyranny and the oppression, so the rebels have to overcome that. So the high stakes is not only the fate of the galaxy, but also the lives of the rebels that are on the line. Their their um, their very lives, and you could also argue that the entire Jedi Order is at stake and the balance mm -hmm. of the Force, if you want to get to that. So there's actually, I would say, probably quite a few things um, in in Star Wars that are high stakes. Sure. Uh, have I missed any? No. Nope. Well, the Death Star, maybe. Um, you know, we're talking about the, the... I'm talking about the first movie, anyway. Um, and so that's... They must succeed to stop that, otherwise it would be widespread destruction, of course. And then there's the larger problem beyond that, and that's why it's... A, series of epic movies. So high stake. What's high stake. at stake? Uh, just by way of one other quick example, the uh, the first, the, the trilogy, the, the prequels in Star Wars, uh, episodes 1, 2, and 3, the high stakes there, of course, George Lucas's reputation. That was the high stakes there. Um, unfortunately, yeah. it didn't turn out well, but, uh, you know, high stakes, high stakes. Yeah, you know, that's uh, funny because I was going to say something else now, and I just kind of blew that thing right out of my mind. <laughs> uh, oh, I was going to talk about, uh, this even applies to literary works, uh, The Old Man and the Sea. The high stakes there is losing his uh, protege, a young boy uh, who's supposed to be learning to fish from the old man who can't catch anything. And so his high stakes is if he doesn't go out and catch something by himself, he loses that, he loses his self-respect, he loses the respect of the small town. So... Uh, it, it doesn't have to be earth-shattering. It can be, as you're talking about, family-related, community-related, 
uh, are just for the individual. I would also say that there's an element of progression here with high stakes. Uh, the stakes don't have to be super high at the outset, um, but they continually get bigger and bigger. Uh, in, in Old Man in the Sea is what I'm thinking of. Uh, that, that's what's on the line. Those are the high stakes that matter very much to the the, uh, the fisherman, but as he gets out there and this fish is pulling him around and now there's sharks that are eating his fish and at some point, you know, it's he's got to get back to shore. Um, you know, you start to wonder if he's going to make it back to shore. Uh, and, and so his life at some point, um, there is some danger there, some imminent threat to his life as well. So the progression of stakes is also key as well. Yeah, that's right. You bring up a very good point because we're talking about high stakes. We're talking about in your planning, you want to have, this is the big issue. You may have other things that they have to deal with. Uh, and sometimes there's a stair step in the action where you, it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse until uh, you get to the high stakes. But as the writer, we're thinking, what's the big issue? That leads us to um, larger than life characters. And this is the one topic that I think uh, most confuses writers. They see larger than life in the uh, character than they think that, uh, of Superman, Batman, you know, the Avengers. Those are all larger than life uh, characters. Uh, of course they are, the superheroes. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's the whole genre. But as, as much as those guys meet the definition of larger than life, it does not have to be that way. It does not have to be a superhero, as in uh, the old man in the sea. It's an old fisherman who probably doesn't have a whole lot longer to live. But he's larger than life because none of us as readers go out on a small boat and fish with hand lines to make our living. Uh, right. So it is, uh, he's larger than life to us. And we, this is why, uh, and we'll, we'll also see this uh, when we, we get to some of the things about uh, uh, setting, for example. Uh, but it, since it's new to us, it's more interesting. That's why uh, doctor shows... Uh, police shows are always the rage because they use a language. Lawyer shows, they use a language that's a little foreign to us. They work in worlds that we don't normally work in, and so it sounds strange to us. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a room with a bunch of professionals who are watching a show that has a bunch of professionals. Um, for example, we used to, when I was a firefighter, we used to watch uh, Emergency, you know, Squad 51, and, uh, and for us it was a comedy. Right. Uh, because they were they were doing a lot of things wrong, <laughs> so, right. um, so it, it just they weren't larger than life characters to us, but other right. shows that's entirely different. So if if your larger than life character is just in a different occupation, a different setting, uh, faces a, a problem different than what your readers are going to know, then uh, that makes your book all the much stronger. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point. I I think we sometimes think. Like you say, larger than life means kind of an over-the-top character, maybe an unbelievable character. But I like that that you're making the point that these can be normal, down-to-earth kinds of people as well. Um, I think those are the most interesting characters, the normal characters who are just a little bit outside of our normal realm of life. Are are they have some sort of job that's unique, fishing with handline or um, they're lawyers that you know are defending zombies. I don't know what it is, but something that's just a little bit different that that we don't get to do every day. We like to see characters doing things we don't get to do every day, or we like to see characters doing what we do every day in a way that we don't normally do it. Right. And so I think it's that uh, what I what I like to say is is making the strange familiar and the familiar strange, making the ordinary extraordinary and the extraordinary ordinary. So if you've got somebody who lives under the sea but they seem very bored with it, it's not boring to us, the readers, because we don't live under the sea. And so what they find boring is actually going to be extraordinary to us. There's going to be that pull, kind of that larger than life feel to it. That's right. So if we go back to the shoes of the fisherman, our running analog here. Uh, he's a larger-than-life character because, one, he was a former political prisoner, uh, two, because he be uh, remains a lowly priest who very quickly becomes a cardinal and then very quickly becomes the pope, sort of against his will in, in a dangerous situation. So he is, though he's being as humble as he possibly can be and is apparently out of his depth, but he has more skills than he realizes, he becomes then a larger-than-life character. And because he is in the Vatican, which most of us don't get to see, we don't get to see how things work behind the, the doors and stuff, and Morse did a good job with 
showing a lot of that uh, stuff that goes on. That's just a very uh, unique situation, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in setting, but we're seeing people we don't normally deal with, and that's what makes the story so interesting. You know, uh, you're mentioning that this guy becomes Pope, but he's kind of a normal guy. It, I'm reminded a little bit of that movie Dave. Uh, you know, Mom's a huge fan of that, and you've got this everyday kind of, I mean, what is he, car salesman, and and but he ends up you know, impersonating the president, and like that's a big, big deal. Like that's strange. Oh no, He's no, still no, 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 no! He has a, a, a what is it? It's an employment agency. Is what he has. Oh, uh, that's right. That's right. That's yes, right. right. And the tagline is "It's Tuesday," and as we all know, everyone works on Tuesday. That's uh, right. As he tries to encourage people, but he has a presidential look-alike. He's a, a double for the president. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. Great movie. Yeah. It's been a while since I've seen it. So, yeah. So larger than life's characters, and what do we have num at number three? We have high stakes, larger than life characters, and the dramatic question. And we've talked about dramatic question a couple of times, uh, so we don't have to uh, sit on this one too long. But what Zuckerman does is he calls it the spine of the book. Now, uh, uh, a decent sized novel is going to have more than one dramatic question, but there is the dramatic question, the heart of it, the spine. It is the central plot, it is the compelling uh, issue for the book. Um, in Hollywood, you use dramatic questions to sell an idea. And the one I've joked about before is Bambi fights Godzilla, Bambi wins. So mm -hmm. there's the, the a quick image and then the surprise turn. That's sort of a the big dramatic question. Can that happen? Someone so small and weak defeat something so big and terrible. Um, and that's the overarching question for that rather silly illustration, but it's the the spine, that great big dramatic question that uh, is going to make the reader worry about is, is the uh, is the actor, is the protagonist and his or her team going to make this work out, or is this the end of life as we know it? So this would be um, akin to an elevator cell or, or a pitch where you have kind of that one line, if you boil your, your story down to one line or one question, what is it? Um, that might be like what happens if you design a video game and then you're magically transported into it, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and, of course, that's the the core of everything. There'll be other storylines that tie into that, but that is it. you can use it as an elevator pitch. I've done that um, uh, many times when uh, somebody asks, what are you working on? And then I give them, I call them taglines. Um, mm -hmm. The USS Triggerfish disappeared 50 years ago, but now it's reappeared in the wrong ocean without its crew, but it did not come back alone. Okay, that's the big thing. What it, it raises all these questions. How could it be in the wrong ocean? Where's its crew? And why is it not alone? And I, I believe on that one, you actually say it arrives 50 years late in the wrong ocean without right. its crew, but it does not arrive alone. Like That's that's one of my favorite taglines. Um, it was just at the, the California Writers Club. Uh, my local branch here in the high desert, and they were talking about log lines, the importance of a log line, and this is kind of feels a lot like a log line to me, the dramatic question where you boil it down, and this is the seed of the idea that really kind of the, from from which the rest of the story sprouts, um, and it's got to be something interesting and unique. It's got to hold our attention, um, something that makes us want to find out the answer. Uh, yeah, th that's it exactly. It's uh, now again we're viewing this as uh, the writer. Uh, I think you should be able to sum up your book in one or two lines, uh, which I call taglines, which is pretty much the same thing as a is a log line. You should be able to reduce it to just a couple of lines uh, and get the core idea across. And you can do that with almost uh, uh, any well written book. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's that's a dramatic question, and it's a it's a a great tool, and I use it to come up with a back cover copy. Once I have it clear in my mind, I can write back cover copy. I can write taglines. I can write advertising copy for the book uh, that I wouldn't be able to do otherwise if I couldn't reduce it down to this one big question. So uh, shoes of the fisherman. The dramatic question is: Can a former prisoner priest who suddenly becomes pope keep the world from destroying itself? Hmm. And all he has to do is overcome his lack of confidence, and uh, the entire Vatican uh, machinery right. um, 
to be able to do this. He has to work against both church and uh, these other states to make it all work out. Absolutely. So very cool stuff. Yeah, the dramatic question. I think that's normally what we start with too, uh, is that dramatic question, and that's where things kind of blossom, or or the larger-than-life character. It, you don't really have to start at any one of these, but uh, trying to weave them all together is a great place to to see if your story is going to have that kind of blockbuster type of peel. Right. So. Right. Excellent. All right. So three. That's three. And what's number four? Multi-point of view. Now, um, we don't always write in multi-point of view, but one of the things that Zuckerman discovered was that most of the best-selling novels when he was researching this book um, were done in multi-point of view. Uh, not first person, but third person multi-point of view. Uh, and for some reason, those were selling better. And there's a reason for that. That gives us more characters to relate to or to hate. Uh, it also, when you doing multi points of view and you're getting into the antagonist's mind, uh, it lets the reader live vicariously in a, you know, if it's just an evil person in an evil person's mind, um, you get a, a little deeper understanding than you can if you're writing in first person and they, they never get to see into the thinking of someone else. So he discovered that the multi point of view uh, brought out a reader emotion more than uh, just a view from a single character. I, I like, yeah, that we're reiterating that this is not a, a requirement, but um, it is a trend that you see. Uh, the thing about third-person omniscient uh, that really, that it, what it does for a book is it really expands the scope of it. First-person very much limits it. Um, Third-person, you can be very, very expansive. Um, I think, again, a, a, of Game of Thrones, and uh, you learn early on that there's a, a brother and a sister who are romantically involved, and it sounds horrifying and disgusting and you're appalled and this is twisted and gross and by the end of the book since we're able to go into their points of view and perspectives you start almost understanding uh, their attraction to one another uh, as, as disgusting as it is uh, you don't necessarily grow to like them at all but I mean what it, as a, I'm amazed at the the craftsmanship um, and this the of character that George R. R. Martin has that he can put a, a character like that and give them come up with something as obscene as that and yet give the characters you know ample motivation to make it believable uh, seems very much over the top but if if we didn't have their perspective their characters we would we would not fully understand their characters the way we do by being able to see inside of their minds and it's not always pleasant to be there but um, it, it definitely changes your opinion of the characters. And so it really expands not only the, the world of the story, but it also expands what you can do within the character and the, the characters as a whole uh, and seeing multiple perspectives on a single character. Uh, so where character A thinks something about character B, but character C thinks something different, you can see those juxtapositions and it helps you to understand those central characters a little bit more. So it does open up a lot of doors uh, it can cause some some problems, but I do like the the fact that it opens so many doors. I think that's what readers really respond to is being able to see the world of the the novel more fully developed and realized. And again, it gives the reader a chance to uh, vicariously live in in different characters, both good and bad. Um, and as writers, it stretches us too. I've written um, from the point of view at least uh, certain scenes, point of view from a crazed killer, a demon-possessed mm -hmm. individual, um, did several books from a woman's point of view, and uh, of course I needed some help with that because that's just walking on a different planet for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, how much I learned uh, from that was, was great for me as a writer. And then to be able to uh, craft that into a book in a realistic way just does a lot uh, really for your skill so multi point of view helps but then again there are certain genres that love the first person point of view and work better uh, primarily mysteries especially cozy mysteries mm -hmm. uh, not so much suspense mysteries uh, but the, the the true old-fashioned mysteries are often uh, much better in uh, first person um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the people watching to help me out here because I've just drawn a blank on the author's name uh, uh, Kinsey Malone, A is for Alibi, 
Sue um, Grafton. Yeah. Sue Grafton, thank you. So I, yeah. we didn't need them. Is that what you're ha, saying? Ha, I beat the room to it. How about <laughs> that? You beat the room. Uh, yeah, Sue Grafton. Uh, I enjoyed reading her books because she was doing first person and uh, from a woman's point of view. And uh, that was just a, an interesting read for me. But uh, her books would probably not have been as successful if they were done in multi-point of view. But she's writing sort of uh, mystery, action mysteries. And, uh, and the purpose in a mystery is to keep a lot of things secret. It's easier to do in first person than it is yeah. in third person. Yeah, I mean, if you're in third person omniscient and you're withholding information, it feels very, um, I don't know, like I, I've never trusted authors who willfully withhold information from me that I should be getting as a reader. I, I'm always skeptical of that, and it, it for me that really breaks the fictive dream. So things like that, you know, really that kind of genre really thrives on the first person. Um, and I would say that if you're writing a, a first person novel and you feel that this needs to be in first person because it needs that limited scope and there is some information that you don't want the readers to have right away, uh, don't don't change your point of view just because you want it to be a blockbuster. You got to be true to your book first. Write a good book first. Um, but if you haven't started writing a book, these are some things to kind of consider. Uh, yes. Do I want to do it in first person or do I want to do it in third? Um, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Well, it looks like the trend in in blockbuster books is for third person omniscient. At least at the time, Albert Zuckerman Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg. <laughs> Zuckerberg. There's going to be a test later. Uh, oh my goodness! I'm, not, I'm yeah, telling you, Zuckerberg. I have not. Man, I have not been sleeping at night. I apologize. I was up <laughs> yesterday at 3:30 a.m. and uh, it's just misery. So if I'm a little off, that's why. Uh, my apologies. But yeah, so be true to your book, but also be aware of some of these these trends as well. Uh, anything else on on that point of view, pops? Well, I, I just want to reiterate what you said. I, I appreciate you saying that very much because I often uh, find people who, uh, when they see a list like this, like we're talking about, they all of a sudden get concerned that they didn't do it this way or this is the only way to do it. Now, this this is an art. Uh, we're trying to teach craft, and craft can only go so far. Craft is what you need to do it properly, but you also, as a creative, need the art. And sometimes you just have to break the rules, and these aren't even rules, these are observations that Zuckerman came up with. Uh, so if, if your book demands to be first person, you need to, you need to run with that. Um, but you, as a writer, and you want to be a professional, you need to at least consider multi-point of view. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually you'll end up with a stronger book, except in certain genres, uh, where you need, to, you need first person. First person is a lot of fun to write, uh, because, and a lot of fun to read because we discover along with the character instead of knowing that somebody's out here to get someone. Um, you know, the uh, I'm thinking of uh, 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 Columbo. Remember Columbo? Long time ago, uh, television show. Excuse you me. You always knew who the you're... bad guy was. Uh huh. Yeah, you always knew who the bad guy was. They showed the murder up front, and then the, the joy is watching Columbo try to figure it out. Well, that worked great on television. It doesn't work that great in a in a mystery or in some other books. So uh, if something needs to be discovered, first person is one of the best ways to go because it allows you proper concealment without misleading yeah. your, your reader. Yeah. I was going to say, you, you've got a pair, a pair of legs that goes all the way to the ground. I just noticed that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I remember. Yeah. And, and the guy who played him was also the, the grandpa in The Princess Bride. That's pretty much the extent of my Columbo Knowledge, no, Peter Falk. Falk. Yeah, quality yeah. actor though. I remember you watching that uh, growing up. You guys watching that? Uh, a lot of fun. I watched Monk. Right in some episodes, you saw the murder ahead of time, but uh, a lot of times you didn't. Um, there's there's an appeal there, uh, like you say, discovering it along with the character, challenging ourselves to see if we can figure it out first. We really enjoy those types of things. So yeah, be true, but be true to your book. I mean, if you're Michelangelo, don't try and paint Da Vinci. Uh, it's you know, or Van Gogh, you've got to kind of make your own Ninja Turtle, um, uh, your own painting. See, see, because Michelangelo and Leonardo. Didn't yeah, have yeah, <sighs> yeah. We're gonna have to get someone else on the show to help corral you. I think. I, uh, I think we do. Imagine if Steve yeah. were here, we wouldn't get anything done. So, by the <laughs> way, we miss you, Steve. So, <laughs> all that's right. That's a fact. So, that's a fact. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you bring up. Um, 
uh, Monk. Monk is is a, a great example. Um, he has high stakes in every episode, and the question is, will he be able to solve the murder before he loses it? You know, because he has this emotional uh, difficulty. Is he a larger than life character? Yeah, he's a detective, but he's also made larger than life in that that he has this disorder, this OCD uh, that he has to deal with, that's based in a trauma. And so all of these things flow together into that uh, little one-hour show each time. So uh, it, it works even in, in those situations there. Yeah. Monk was a good show. Absolutely. Uh, what do we got on number four? Are we up to four now? Oh, I think we're past four. We did high stakes. Oh, five. Yeah. Uh, larger than life, dramatic question, high concept, multi-point of view. So we're on the last one. Oh, uh, now wow. that We can uh, see if there's any questions that are our folks have for us. But the next one is setting. And this is similar to me. I don't think Zuckerman put him this way, but for me it's similar to uh, what's going on with the uh, larger-than-life character. They're characters we uh, gravitate towards because they're unique. The same thing with setting. So again, a police show is interesting because we don't spend much time in, a, in police headquarters or at murder scenes. Uh, we don't spend much time in hospitals doing things for other patients. Uh, so that's why hospital shows. One of my favorite books is Arthur C. Clarke's Rendezvous with Rama. Uh, and I believe it ought to be must reading for anyone interested in science fiction. Now I need to let you know he over narrates, he does everything we tell you not to do, but he's Arthur C. Clarke and it all works anyway. So uh, it's just magic. Uh, but Rendezvous with Rama is a story about a massive cylinder that appears uh, in orbit around the Earth. And it turns out it's hollow, and a spaceship goes up there with a crew to figure out what's going on. They make their way in, and what they see is uh, what amounts to an abandoned city that runs for miles in this huge, huge cylinder, and it spins and provides gravity. Uh, now, that's a setting. Hmm. That's a setting. They, you go from Earth to a spaceship to inside this thing, and everything is different inside. And so the setting itself becomes uh, a character, perhaps the most stunning character in the whole book is is not one of the humans, it's uh, or any alien, it's Ra uh, Rama, which is what they've named the cylinder. So this is Rendezvous with Rama. It's a great book. I've read it several times. Uh, there was a sequel to it also, but there he used setting uh, that was so unique that it's unforgettable. And even now, decades later, I, uh, I think of that book fondly because of the setting that it, uh, it brought up. Yeah, I agree. I think setting is one of the things that really, at least in my experience, uh, really helps separate the good from the very good or, you know, the, the very good from the best. Um, I can generally tell a, a new writer because they tend to pay a lot less attention to setting, and I think it's because they want to tell a story and they want to talk about their characters. Uh, but I remember in, in college, I had... Uh, I've probably told this story several times. I apologize if, if you've heard it before, uh, if you've been listening since the beginning. But I uh, wrote a quick little piece, uh, kind of a, an untraditional love story, if you will. Um, and I remember my professor's comments were, where does this story take place? And I said, oh, it's just a small town, not a big deal. He goes, no, it is a big deal. He goes, a love story in New York is not a love story in Dallas, is not a love story in Elon, California, is not a love story in Fresno, California, is not a love story in Florida, is not a love story in Bermuda, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and he was absolutely right. And the more I've challenged myself to really focus on setting and develop setting, um, that's, you know, the setting can really take off on you and, and really provide a lot of, of good conflict and um, can help inform your characters. We've heard the expression, you can take the, the cowboy out of Texas, you can't take the Texas out of cowboy. I mean, these settings affect our characters, and so there's a, a relationship between the two that I don't think we can ignore, and we shouldn't. The best writers, the best blockbuster novels are generally going to have that. They understand that. Um, this is why I spent so much time on setting in The Bargain, is because I was challenged by my professor you know, setting is important, mm -hmm. and so everything in the bargain uh, takes place in one particular setting and, and seems to revolve, revolve revolves around that particular setting, and uh, I had to make sure that I was getting it right. Um, otherwise, the reader would have immediately identified it 
Um, and it, it would have been a bit of a train wreck of a novel, if you will, without that, those details of setting. Wait a minute, a train wreck of a novel? Don't you have a train wreck in that novel? I, I do. Um, a couple mm. of them, I, I think, actually. So I, I didn't know if you'd well, pick up on that, but... I did, I did, and you did an excellent job on that, and I know this just sounds like you know, just mutual admiration society, and I'm not uh, trying to do that, but you made that high desert area a character uh, that uh, is as real as any of the human characters in it. It, uh, it set tone, uh, it, it was at times foreboding and distant, it, uh, it had almost human qualities to it. You know, it doesn't speak, but it's a player from beginning to end, and that's the power of setting. Now, and what that illustrates, and, and what I want people to get out of this is, it doesn't have to be a gigantic cylinder that comes and gets in Earth's orbit like Arthur C. Clarke's Rendezvous with Rama. Just the high desert area of California. Pretty mundane, but when done properly in a book, it, it, comes, it comes to life almost. It's almost like a, a human character or a human monster a human monster, or a monster, um, or, or something like that. So it doesn't have to be totally bizarre, but it needs to be very unique. And that's why I, Stephen King does small town stories. Um, and, and let's think a little bit about uh, some of the more famous stories that have rather unique settings. Journey to the Center of the Earth, the setting is? Mm -hmm. The center of the earth. The center of the earth and the tunnels that lead down to it. Of course, there's a lot of other story around it, the high concept and... Uh, larger than life characters and all the other things, but uh, that's certainly one. Tom Clancy's Hunt for Red October, a lot of that takes place on the submarine Red October. Mm -hmm. Very unique setting there. Um, not just any Middle submarine, earth. but a very special one. Middle Earth, a galaxy far, far away. Um, I mean, the, the list goes on with our most beloved... Uh, films and and novels. There are particular places you can even make rides at Disneyland about spaceships that travel to far away distant planets uh, from the Star Wars universe because they felt real to us and tangible and 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 important. Uh, and we we worry about the Shire as much as we worry about Frodo. Um, setting very very important. And just in the interest of continuing our mutual admiration society. Um, I, I, your books take place in San Diego. I'm thinking of uh, uh, A Ship Possessed in which you got letters, I think, from Navy personnel that asked what, what submarine you served on because you mm -hmm. had done the research and, and you described it in such detail, accurate detail, that um, people who had been there uh, assumed that you had also been there. And so the power of, of getting the details right or at least including details in a fictional place like like Middle Earth it's important and it, it sticks with our uh, it sticks with us as as a people as a readership for sure yeah and a lot of that of course came from research but that was the goal was to make this World War II diesel submarine they call them diesel boats big boats um, a character in of itself without it ever speaking of course there's some evil involved in it too so it takes on a, a whole different persona but that was uh, that was the goal, and uh, I, I always consider that the highest compliment when somebody thinks you've been someplace you haven't been because you describe it so well or you uh, served someplace you did serve. And in that particular book, uh, uh, that, that worked out quite well for me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and then again, you, you can make some things up because it is fiction. So uh, I often will, in my settings, choose something. Uh, the Maddie Glenn series, which were uh, mystery suspense books, uh, take place in a fictional city, but I based it on Ventura. Mm -hmm. If you go to Ventura and read the book in Ventura, you go, oh, oh, that's the hill he's talking about over there. And this is the road by the beachfront here that he's talking about. And that's uh, because I use the city, I just change things. But I wanted that special setting that Ventura offered, and then I tweaked it to meet, uh, meet my needs. And that's the great thing about being a, a fiction writer. Uh, you can do those things. You know, I, I think of Big Hero 6. We just saw that with the kids uh, this this last weekend. San Francisco, France and so San Francisco, is that what it's called? The, that <laughs> city, it's, it's fictional. It's kind of that hybrid between San Francisco and Tokyo. A lot of fun to, to see. Uh, what, what an incredible idea to come up with a setting like that um, and, and make it a, a player as well. Um, 
I thought it was a, a film that was well done. So coming up with ideas of, from, like you say, Ventura, but tweaking it a little bit, those those are the things that tend to stay with us as, as readers. And uh, some pretty powerful think, stuff. Very powerful. Yeah, when we think of, of Narnia, mm -hmm. Oz, Wonderland, those books uh, continue to, to be read, and they're still powerful because of the unique setting. Mm -hmm. So when you, you pull all these together, you get the high stakes. There's something to be lost, so we've got to root for success, and it doesn't look like success is going to happen, but we've got to believe that the hero is going to be able to do whatever it is they need to do based on the genre. Larger-than-life characters, larger-than-life meaning different than what the reader is used to experiencing, so that can be a small thing from a fisherman in a boat to... Um, somebody flying spaceships, it can be anything along those lines, the dramatic question, that spine, that thing that keeps pushing things forward. The high concept is really the outlandish premise. We didn't talk about that too much, being the outlandish, surprising premise in the high concept um, that gives it that little extra twist. Multi-point of view, if it fits your book, and, uh, and I noticed Zuckerman makes this statement about all of these, and we just talked about setting, is that fiction is art and art is not mathematics. So... It's good to know all these things, but you may need to tweak them a little for your particular book. And that's where the writer is artist. I, I think of uh, Kurt Vonnegut's Eight Rules for Writing Fiction. He says, you know, the greatest writer uh, I've ever read is Flannery O'Connor, and she broke every one of my rules. It just kind of has that, that echo of do what's right for your book, um, but also be aware of these things. Also be aware of the trends in art. What do people like to see in art? And if you're looking to write something that's going to sell, uh, these are some good guidelines uh, to, to follow, Some perhaps some ideas that will stimulate your mind to get you thinking of how to, to get your book from where it is to take that next step um, to maybe increase the sellability of it or make it more attractive to an agent or a publisher, um, etc., Again, don't compromise the integrity of your book. Uh, don't change point of view just to change it. You should always have a reason and be true to your art. But uh, these are some good things to definitely consider. So, uh, and that's what they are. They are considerations. Um, yeah, like you say, you don't want to. We don't want to get the position where we're just checking these off because we think that's going to make the perfect book. We can find plenty of books that have all of these things that just failed uh, miserably. Uh, these are no guarantee. These are just things that Zuckerman noticed best-selling books having in common. But, of course, there's there's always um, the, the exception. In fact, Arthur C. Clarke, I would go through and read that and go, uh, you know, after I became a writer, you know, Arthur, Arthur, this is, this is too much narration. You really could cut. Okay, so you can't cut that, but you could cut the next. All right, I'd leave that too. And then what I found out was I, I couldn't change it and make it better. He, he just got it right, even though, I was taught that you do things differently. It didn't matter. He did the art. Isn't that beautiful, though? I mean, it having is. having that, like, I mean, appreciating the art and, and understanding how the art works. Uh, I just love that, knowing knowing how things work and, and appreciating how seamless things are and knowing that, oh, you broke a rule, but I see why well, you did that. Good call there. I love that kind of stuff. Uh, love that kind of stuff. Real quick question before we, we start signing off here, but um, mm -hmm. uh, Molly asked uh, earlier, I don't think she put it here in the, the room, but I thought it was an, an interesting question that she posed earlier, uh, I think through Facebook. She asked if, if there were uh, another, maybe not rule, but guideline here for a blockbuster book, uh, what would we say? What, what would be our opinion of you know, one other thing to add? If there was a number seven, what would it be? So... Um, I'll put you on the spot, Pops. Do you have an idea of if, if you were to list uh, qualities of, of blockbuster books that might fit into this list? Might be number seven. Molly, Molly, Molly. I've never had a blockbuster hit, so I'm not sure I'm qualified to say. Um, I, I know what I find working well for me as a reader, and that is just very tight writing. I'm not putting useless stuff in, useless words, use, useless sentences, useless chapters, just getting to the story. But it seems to me those that do the best and are artistically correct, and I mean, it, there's some real creativity in it. They're not just lucky or hitting on a topic that suddenly becomes a big blockbuster movie. Um, they, they love the story. You see the love of the story coming out on the page. They do not forget their reader. They don't, they don't forget their reason. They don't forget their reader. I like that. Don't forget the reader. 
I would also say I'm, gonna, I'm trying to think of how to word this um, to try and be, you know, cutesy and, and, and crafty. Uh, I would say uh, don't give your readers what they think they want. Give them what they really want. Or mm. perhaps another way to say that is make your readers want the ending that you give them. Uh, I think of, uh, I can't remember where I read this, but somebody was giving the ex example of uh, buying a bicycle for their children for Christmas and their kids were completely uninterested in bicycles, had no desire for bicycles at all. But they bought the parents had bought these bicycles in November or whatever the case was, and they spent the entire month of December convincing their children that they wanted bikes. And lo and behold, on Christmas, those kids got the bikes they really wanted. Uh, and I, in writing the way that looks is, is don't give them the readers what they expect because then it's too predictable. But what you give them should definitely be satisfying. It should be something that they didn't see coming, but was, in retrospect, it was inevitable. It's Flannery O'Connor's The Unexpected But Inevitable Ending. I find that to be really successful, especially in the works of, uh, say, Brandon Sanderson, where he'll take a common trope, he'll turn it on his head, and then you look back at it and you go, oh, of course, I probably should have known that sooner. Hmm. Yeah. There's a lot to it, isn't there? Oh, yeah, and I mean, every book is different, every writer is different, um, but uh, some good stuff here, some good stuff here, so. Yeah, Zuckerman um, did a good uh, good job. Uh, I'm reading, of course, the older uh, version. This goes back to when I was first learning to write, so um, some of the stuff in it is a little dated. Um, by that, I mean just the books that he references, uh, but they're still pertinent, I think, and the book, I believe, is uh, very worthwhile to read and to use. Excellent. Absolutely. Well, that is about the time that we've got. Um, Pops, how can they get a hold of you? Well, uh, just as it says in the bottom of the lower third there, the altengansky.com, and from there you can bridge to the Writers Conference. We've got all our classes listed there at uh, BRMCWC. That's Blue Ridge Mountain Christian Writers Conference.com. But from there you can uh, see First in Fiction. You can see my show, uh, Writers Talk. Uh, there and then um, just some of the other things that are that are going on there. So that's the easiest way to get hold of me. Excellent. Uh, and as always, you guys can find me at AaronGansky.com. Uh, that's where you'll find the podcast uh, and the the YouTube replays and all that good stuff. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and again, just one more quick shout out for the Green Bench. Again, it's Indiegogo.com slash projects slash the Green Bench film. Uh, and if you, like I say, five bucks here, five bucks there, we'll start adding up. So uh, would definitely appreciate you helping out Diane in that regard. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, it'll be a quality film. So something to look forward to. Thank you all for joining us. Appreciate you listening. And until next week, good writing. <laughs>